Hey, welcome everybody. This is uh, part two to um, the PC, PCDC from last time. But uh, I want to open up, if you're like me, I'm struggling with Monday morning fog brain. I get our, our DS is in a fog. I, I may be in a fog, then I may wake up around 1030 or so. But I um, want to share a devotional and just get our minds wrapped around this uh, topic. We've, this is part two of developing um, healthy spiritual leaders. And so I want to share with you a devotional. Then I want to share with you a little article. You know about um, the California mega pastor that committed suicide a couple weeks ago? You know about that? Okay, so you got brain fog because you're all looking at me like, no, it's true. Another pastor committed suicide. And so we, we got to talk about what, what on earth is going on. Like, what, what brings somebody to a place as a minister of the gospel that um, in such despair that um, he commits suicide? In many ways, last time we were together in this time, you can sum it up by simply saying, this is about building resilience inside of us. The greatest defense of the gospel is a life lived in a long obedience in the same direction. And so that's what these really these two sessions are about. So let me open up sharing with you a devotional. Actually, from yesterday in, in my devotional reading, The Power of Weakness. And I'm going to read to you from 2 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, starting in verse 3, in the message version, we all know this, right? The Apostle Paul says we comfort those with the comfort that we ourselves have received from Christ. Um, but in the message version, you know, Eugene Peterson has a, just a, a cool way of saying this. So um, let's bow our heads together and pray. Our gracious God, on a Monday morning, after probably a long weekend of some really wonderful things, we've had the privilege of worshiping you and being with your people, collectively coming together as the church. But we probably had a lot of things going on this weekend that didn't have anything to do with actually Sunday morning. So as we come together on a Monday morning, would you help us to zone in and hear what you have to say to us today through your word, through your spirit. In the name of Christ, I pray these things. Amen. Second Corinthians chapter one, verse three, all praise to the God and Father of our Master, Jesus the Messiah, Father of all mercy, God of all healing counsel. He comes alongside us when we go through hard times. Can I hear an amen? amen. And before you know it, he brings us alongside someone else who's going through hard times, so that we can be there for that person just as God was there for us. We have plenty of hard times that come from following the Messiah. We have plenty of hard times that come from following the Messiah, but no, no more so than the good times of his healing comfort. We get a full measure of that too. Now when we suffer for Jesus, it works out for your healing and your salvation. If we are treated well, if we are given a helping hand and an encouraging word, then that also works to your benefit, spurring you on, face forward, unflinching. Your hard times are our hard times. When we see that you're just as willing to endure the hard times as we enjoy the good times, we know that you're going to make it, no doubt about it. And then the Apostle Paul, carrying the same theme, switches it, And then he talks about some hard times that he's endured. So he's not just talking about the general principle of we comfort those with the comfort that we ourselves have received. Then he turns it and says, oh, let me tell you about a hard time that I went through. 
So we don't want you to be in the dark, friends, about how hard it was when, we, when all this came down on us in Asia province. It was so bad, we didn't think that we were going to make it. We felt like we had been sent to death row, that it was all over for us. And as it turned out, it was the best thing that could have happened. Because instead of trusting in our own strength or wits to get out of it, we were forced to trust God totally. Not a bad idea, since he's the God who raises the dead. So let me tell you a theory that I have, and feel free to, to challenge it. It's just an observation that I've made. I think that God wants ministers to go through a wide range of experiences specifically so that you and I can identify with the people we serve. I think that we have a front row seat like no other to see the great things that God is doing, the unbelievable works that we see in people's lives. I did a funeral a week and a half ago by this godly lady in our congregation who just dropped dead, and she has three girls. And her husband doesn't come to church. And in fact, he's been kind of ambivalent about it. And we sat down with the family, and it was really um, so tragic. 46 years old, two days before her birthday, a heart condition she didn't know she had, and nobody would have discovered it unless she had heart surgery. Like, that's never going to happen. After Ann and I meet with the family, the husband pulls me aside and he says, can I talk to you for a minute? I said, yeah, sure. Everybody leaves. He says, I want to know Jesus Christ as my personal savior. He said, I was not the best husband. I was not the best father, but I want to be with my wife and my family in heaven. And I know that she lived a godly life and I'm not. And so would you lead me to Christ? We're front row seats to the good things that God is doing that nobody else sees in that way. But here's what I think. I think we have a front row seat to a lot of other things too. So here's my theory. I think that God wants ministers to have a large range of experiences that most people will never experience. That's why ministers, I think, struggle with finances. That's why I think ministers struggle with sometimes health issues. That's why ministers struggle with conflict. That's why ministers struggle with being misunderstood. It, you know, sometimes we struggle in our home relationships. We have kids that are not following the Lord. How can it be that we raise our kids in the church and they're not following Jesus? You know what I'm saying? So you have marital problems sometimes. You know, I mean, we have the full range. And here's what I think. I think that God wants us to have that full range of experiences that very few people in our culture ever have for the express purpose of knowing and identifying what other people are going through in the church family and in the world so that we can offer the comfort that we ourselves have received from the Lord to other people. So that's my theory. Two paragraphs from my devotional guide that I'm reading through. We may think that we attract others to Christ more effectively through our strengths than our weaknesses. But the Lord used trouble and weakness in the Apostle Paul's life to teach him to rely on God's power. He testified, when I am weak, then I am strong. When Christians act as if they hardly know what weakness is, needy people often think, I could never be like them. But when Christians admit their when Christians admit they experience Christ's strength and their weakness, they proclaim this hope that Christ gives me strength and he can to you as well. Whose strength will you proclaim today? Yours or God's? This is the setup to last time we were together and this time because I'm just basically going to pick up where I left off the last time 
and we're going to talk about how to be emotionally healthy, how to be spiritually healthy, and um, this issue of resilience. It's really hard being a pastor these days. Maybe it was always hard, but I feel like it's harder now than what it was 30 years ago. Maybe it's just me with age. I really don't know. I'm just saying the issue is a long obedience in the same direction, this issue of staying power when you feel like giving up or just feel like going through the motions. So another California megachurch pastor commits suicide after a long struggle with mental health. A California mega pastor was found in his home on Wednesday dead from a self-inflicted gunshot wound. Jim Howard of the 6,000-member Real Life Church took his life on Wednesday, ending his lifelong battle with mental illness. Rusty George, another lead pastor um, of Real Life Church, released a statement on Facebook on behalf of the church announcing the heartbreaking news. Um, sadly, George said Jim suffered in private with mental health challenges, some of which he bravely discussed in public and was wrestling with some personal issues in recent months. This week, he made the tragic decision to end his pain. He will be deeply missed by his family and friends and the Real Life Church family and all who are blessed to know him. Can I ask you a question? I'm hoping it's not rhetorical, but how, how do we get there? What's the pathway to getting to such a dark place, even though you know Jesus? Because... Jim Howard knew Jesus, right? He stood up every Sunday and preached Jesus. He preached the hope of the resurrection. He preached that you can overcome sin. He preached that you can overcome your weaknesses. And yet, he takes a bullet to his brain. It can't be just that, you know, he was mentally unstable. There's other factors. What are some of those other factors? What are some things that have brought you to the edge? Oh, and by the way, there's no harm in admitting that because you're in good company. Moses said, come on, God, strike me dead. I can't take any more. <laughs> Elijah, the same exact point. He, they're on the edge. What brings you to the edge? Anybody want to just um, share some things that come to your mind? Physical suffering. Physical suffering. Absolutely. A sense of disconnection. Okay? Hopelessness that's never going to change. It's always going to be like this, so why bother? Yeah. Hitting a massive rock with a little hammer year after year <coughs> after year. Okay? What else? Unresolved conflicts or issues that we take from childhood many times. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so how do you do that? Great, great observation. I think for me, part of it is finding my self-worth in what I see as ministry success. Because when that doesn't happen, I don't see myself as a failure. Or even when things don't go well and I'll have someone who starts to bring <clears throat> my character and my motives, I can barely discern that. You know, you can take a lot of things, but when somebody goes after your character... There is something so profoundly discouraging about that because at the end of the day, that's all you have, right? You know what makes ministry so hard? Responsibility with very little authority, right? You're responsible for the church, but, you know, 98% of the congregation is, is um, volunteer. So you're left with this, I'm responsible, but I have very little authority to really pull off a lot of things. And when people start questioning your character, it's almost like that's the end. Anything else? You won't listen to your side, but take one side of the story and pronounce judgment. Ooh, that's good. Yeah. So all this provides a segue into what we're going to talk about um, this morning. And a couple things, housekeeping. Um, at 10.30, if I don't stop, somebody just wave me down. We'll take a break. The second thing is my wife Holly is here today 
to keep me honest, okay, when we talk about the, these subjects, but she's really here because we're going to talk about something called social base teaching, which is in, in leadership development, it talks about how leaders who finish well, leaders who thrive, take care of their family first. There's a ton of research on this, but it really comes down to one thing. If mama ain't happy, okay, it's, it's, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but not much. Unbelievable, right? People who study leadership their entire lives, people who study leaders' families their entire lives, come down to that one single principle. And so we'll unpack that, and what does it look like in the home to be a great leader and take care of your family. Okay, so let's go ahead and begin. Um, June, am I, there it is. So I'm picking up where I left off the last time, and I, and I kind of moved through our last time together fairly quickly, and I should have said this ahead of time. We hit a lot of topics last time we were together, but I'm doing the thumbnail approach. Each one of these could be separate topics that we spend the entire PCDC on, but I didn't want to do that. I just wanted to give thumbnails on each of these. So I ended the last time with talking about the minister and anxiety. By the way, we all have anxiety, so don't think that you're less spiritual if you don't have any anxiety. The issue is managing your anxiety. That's the real issue. Um, so <clears throat> a couple things. Um, St. Augustine said, Grant, Lord, that I may know myself, that I may know thee. Grant, Lord, that I may know myself, that I may know thee. John Calvin said, you cannot know God without knowing yourself, and you cannot know yourself without knowing God. They go together. Another generation, Peter Scazzaro, Life Church in Queens, just retired, actually, I think, what, about a year ago, two years ago. Um, it's impossible to be spiritually mature while remaining emotionally immature. It gets back to what you were talking about, B.W. <laughs> if you're emotionally immature, you cannot possibly be spiritually mature. Okay? Um, Okay, did you hear that? that? That's worth, actually, that's worth the whole seminar. You can all go home now, right? Because that's worth it. When you're under pressure, when you're intimidated, when you feel backed into a corner, ask yourself the question, how old do I feel? That's the point that needs the work. And that's the age you ought to be looking at. Right. So if you feel like a 12-year-old, if you feel like you're six years old, you're vulnerable, and, you know, that's the point where you begin. Okay? Good. Ministers get into trouble when they forget that they are human. You are the tool that the Lord is using to advance his kingdom. You are responsible to steward yourself for the glory of God. So let's talk about the minister and burnout. Again, this could be a whole topic for PCDC. I'm just hitting the thumbnail. What is burnout? Burnout is actually a syndrome. Now, a syndrome is a group of symptoms, okay? A group of symptoms of emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, and reduced personal accomplishments that occurs in individuals who work with people. You never get burned out by one thing. It's always several things that hit you all at the same time. So it's this idea of emotional exhaustion. You're just wiped out emotionally depersonalization, reduced personal accomplishments. I put in no harvest. I, I redid some slides, and so you don't see it here, but I put in no harvest. I'll get back to that. And somebody mentioned this. The reason why you get to a point of despair is that you're, you're hitting your head up against the wall. You're preaching every Sunday the best that you know how to preach. You're talking to people, and you don't feel like there's any movement. There's any fruit of your labor. And what do you do when you feel the church going backwards? When the attendance is going this way instead of this way? And you, you don't know what to do. 
that's where burnout is mo most likely to hit. So burnout is also um, demoralizing. It's a giving up, a I have nothing else to give mindset. I don't care anymore. It's just one more person who needs my help. It's too little resources and too much caring. You hear that? It's a combination of too little resources and too much caring. Okay, you can overcare. And you can overlove. I know that that's counterintuitive. But when you overcare and overlove, you begin to take on other people's burdens that you were never meant to take on. Right? Causes of ministerial burnout. Yeah. Yeah, no, please interrupt all day long. That's fine. Okay, so what do you think it is? I have an image in my mind. What is depersonalization? You lose yourself. We forget that we're human. Now, there's a flip side to depersonalization. You're not actually treating people as people anymore. You're treat them, treating them as just, you know, a group, one more. You don't look at people. You don't see people anymore. You just see problems and patterns. That's a depersonalization. You feel depersonalized, a tool being used. You forget you're human. It's autopilot. Come on now. Everybody who's been in ministry more than a year knows what it means to be on autopilot. So don't look at me like, oh, I've never heard that term before. You know what I'm saying? Did, was that adequate? Okay. So causes of ministerial burnout. And by the way, if somebody would look up on their phone, Numbers chapter 11, verses 13 through 15. This is Moses. We're going to get to it in a moment. And then 1 Kings 19, 13 and 14. It's just two verses each. But that, this is coming. So causes of ministerial burnout. Inadequate support and rewards. What does that mean? Ministerial burnout occurs when there is inadequate support and rewards. What, what does that mean? Yes? Okay. Rewards can be tangible. I didn't get a raise in five years. Rewards can be tangible in the sense of nobody has sent you an encouraging note or email. You haven't heard anything from anybody saying, like, good job, pastor, or, hey, that message meant something to me. You know, those are rewards. And when you don't get any rewards, you begin to question yourself. Am I on track? Am I making a difference? Ongoing minor conflicts. <laughs> Ongoing minor conflicts is like death by a thousand cuts. It's rarely the big conflicts that knock you off. It's the thousand little conflicts that go unresolved, that build up over time. That's what causes burnout. Lack of assertiveness. What does it mean, lack of assertiveness, that causes burnout? You know you should be. Yes. You, you become paralyzed because you know you should speak to that person, but you don't speak to that person, and it causes you to become more paralyzed, and, and you have five conversations in your head. You have 30 conversations in your head. And because you're not assertive, you either do nothing and burn out, or you flip and you go overboard in these conversations. And so the 30 conversations you have stuck in the back of your head, somebody ticks you off, boom, you blow them out of the water. But it really wasn't them. It was the 30 conversations you didn't have before them. That's what happens, okay? Over-idealization over of ministry. Okay, what's that? Over-idealization of ministry. It's the romance. Right? We go into ministry and we just think, you know, people are always going to be to the altar when we preach. 
right? You know, I'm going to lead 50 people to the Lord this year. That's my goal. Um, when, you read, when you lead two people to the Lord or you don't lead anybody to the Lord. Oh, we're going to pay our budgets this year. Um, everybody's going to think I'm great. Um, we're going to have the best board meeting we've ever had. Right? It's the over-idealization of ministry. That leads to burnout. Unrealistic expectations. Um, work with little or no results. I don't know if you know the name of Jack Eyestone. Jack Eyestone used to be the district superintendent of Missouri District. And we got connected along the way. And Jack was truly one of the funniest people I'd ever met. And he just had plain old horse sense. So when we lived in Council Bluffs, Iowa, we were at the intersection, inter Interstate 80. It was kind of funny because we'd go back and visit my parents that were in the, uh, in the Ephrata, New Holland area. And we'd get on Interstate 80, and we literally lived two miles off of Interstate 80 in Council Bluffs, Iowa. So it was like the most boring ride ever. We'd get on the highway and stay there for 13 hours. Okay? So Jack Eyestone, on his way preaching, because he was never on his district, he was always preaching someplace else. Okay? He was a great preacher, great evangelist. He'd stop by my office and say, hey, I'm on my way. And he always had this rough voice, right? He'd go, hey, I'm on my way to North Dakota. You want to go out to lunch? Well, today's sermon day, Jack. They don't care. <laughs> Let's go out to lunch. So we'd go out to lunch. He'd take like five hours. I'd get back in the office at 4.30. I got nothing, right? And I'm like, oh, God, you got to help me. Anyway, Jack Eyestone once said, ministers die in the vine because there's no harvest. You look at your work in the church, and you don't see any fruit, and you wither. And his thing was, don't get somebody else's burning bush. Go get your own. <laughs> and stay before God until God gives you your burning bush. I just found that to be really helpful. Okay, Numbers chapter 11, verses 13 through 15. You've got to follow your own unique vision, okay? In other words, just don't go to a seminar and pick up and say, I'm bringing this back to the church. You know what I'm saying? That's a recipe for disaster, right? You, you, you have to, this is old school, right? So I know we're talking a lot about emotional health. You know what old school is? Old school is getting on your knees before God and saying, I'm not getting up until you strengthen me, oh God. I'm not getting up until you give me a vision that is birthed in my heart for the church at this time, at this place. Many of us are skimming ministry, looking for the next bullet that's going to make an impact while we just should go old school and just get down on our face before God. Does that make sense? Amen. Okay? Numbers chapter 11, verses 13 through 15. Got it? Jim, go ahead and stand up, if you don't mind. And then who has 1 Kings 19... 13 and 14. The, Moses and Elijah, two great examples of great people who burned out. Where am I supposed to get meat for all these people? They keep whining to me saying, give us meat to eat. I can't carry all these people by myself. The load is far too heavy. If this is how you intend to treat me, just go ahead and kill me. Do, I, do me a favor and spare me this meat. Man, preach that on Sunday morning. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yes, yes. God is still on the throne. Right. Not today. <laughs> First Kings 19, 13 to 14. Anybody have that? You got it? Go ahead. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. Can you say it with more emotion in your voice? Yeah. I am the only one left. <laughs> you realize how gracious God is in responding to Elijah, right? Not in the fire, not in the earthquake, a gentle voice. So who burns out? Well, people like Elijah and Moses. So who burns out? Determined idealists. You know who get most wounded in ministry? 
It's not the pragmatists. It's the idealists. Because they have higher expectations. Do you know who leaves the church because they've been hurt? Idealists. Not pragmatists. Idealists. Overcommitted people burned out. Burn out over dedicated people, overly sympathetic people, and usually, this is a generalization, type B personality people. Type A personality people rarely burn out. They do what? They have a panic attack. Type A people lean toward panic attacks, which really are almost like heart attacks. They feel exactly like a heart attack. Type B people usually burn out. Well, they feel more intensely, type B people feel more intensely. They don't use support systems. They have a tendency to kind of pull themselves inward and separate themselves. They are more easily demoralized. They tend to be loners. And the key to overcome burnout is to externalize. So if you're a type B personality, the way out of burnout, part of the way out, is to simply start talking and externalizing because that's not your natural way. To deal with burnout. Okay? Um, three in five pastors, after 10 years of ministry, are in chronic burnout. That means you're in burnout, you get out of burnout, you're in burnout, you're out of burnout, you're in burnout. It's this constant chronic cycle. Three in five within 10 years. A major, a major overhaul is needed to fix chronic burnout. Ministers need to get serious about self-care. And what do I mean by self-care? Talking about the physical factors like sleep, rest, exercise, psychological factors, dealing with hidden addictions, unrealistic expectations, depression issues, and spiritual issues. And do you need a spiritual director or a spiritual mentor? In other words, who are you looking up to? Who are you reaching up to spiritually? Not just in, in not any other area, just, just spiritually. Who are you reaching up to? Mark, my, I did my research 20 right. years ago for my doctorate. But the research then said that the ministers who burn out actually burn out in their first five years of ministry. They may not experience it for 20 years or 30 years. Cool. But, All right. But the, the element. If not, we're contributing to a failure of the next generation of pastors. Right. So this is not rocket science. It's following the leadership of the Lord. Interestingly, I'm glad you said that because, you know, I was in the McCungy Church. That's where the first church that Holly and I pastored. And we were there for five years, like four, four years and ten months. After the first two years, I was in burnout but never acknowledged that I was in burnout. I didn't even know what it was. And I was writing resumes to leave the ministry within five years. And the thing that kept me grounded, ironically, was PCDC. Of all the things, it was PCDC. Because I kept coming, and I keep saying to myself, I can do it a little bit longer. Because I was around other people, and some of you were here 30 years ago, but I was hearing things that you were saying and I was, and it wasn't even necessarily what was being taught. I was hearing things, the conversations around the table, and I was thinking, oh, they're just like me. Oh, they're experiencing some of the same things I'm experiencing. And somehow, although I couldn't identify it at the time, somehow that gave me strength that I wasn't alone and that some of the common things that ministers face, that we all face them. And it was that informal mentoring that indirect mentoring that kept my head screwed on straight and kept me in the ministry. Now, it's the Holy Spirit that kept me in the ministry. It was my call of God. God would not let me go. But it was the human tangible part that was all part of this. So mentoring is a big deal. We burn out when we go secret. And we just think we're the only ones. this 
existed. Uh, the, the, the DS called me and told me I need to get married and shave my beard. And, and the way people dealt with me was so weird that, to be honest, I still don't trust DS as a preacher. And that's just, I'm just being honest. It's very hard for me to connect. You know, it's very hard for me to let down and be honest with people. And, and that's, that's been 30 years. <laughs> sure. So I'm just being honest. Praise yeah. God you had that scenario. I'm not sure everybody has. So yeah. sometimes it's very hard to let down those walls and, and join in. That's all I'm saying. I'm not putting down what you said. Praise God. No, I God. totally get it. Right. I, I, to this day, struggle with that. So here's the thing. Now, I'm, I'm not saying it to you, John. I'm yeah. saying it across the board. I said it last time. If you don't have a friend, go rent one. Okay? If you don't have a friend, go rent one. Do you have a beer in 1990? Huh? Do you have a beer in 1990? No, man, this was in Haiti. Oh, Haiti. Were you, <laughs> Gary, were, were you born yet? Come on, be honest. Okay, so the minister also needs to develop a healthy theology. So this is about overcoming burnout, right? Okay? You got to remember, you're human, I'm human. So the minister also needs to develop a healthy theology of success, of failure, of self-care, of soul care, and of compassion. <clears throat> Most of us are living, you know, the unexamined lives. What was that, Walt Whitman quote? And so, no, it was Emerson. Um, so the, the point is, is that we actually need to dig down deeper and say we need to create a theology of what success looks like. And if, and if your theology of success is about your church growing and going a certain way, that's you know, that sounds fine for the season, and you're feeling great, but what happens if the church tops off, and what happens if the church goes down? You're tied to that, right? And so you don't want to be tied to that because, you know, you don't want your feeling of success to be based on numbers. You want it to be based on the Lord Jesus Christ, okay? And so many of us have not created a theology of failure. We've not created a theology of self-care or of soul care. Just go have your devotions. Well, it's a little bit more complicated than that. Okay? Um, oops. The minister must also develop an adequate support system and a program for spiritual replenishment. We're going to get to that a little bit later. Um, a lot of burnout is because ministers have shifted to an entrepreneurial model of success. The business world has come into the church, and we are largely adopting a business model unaware. Now, Augustine said, more or less, all truth is God's truth, which means you can learn truth from a variety of different areas. But I remember the shift taking place back in the 70s and into the early 80s where everybody, every church had to get a mission statement, every church had to have a vision statement, every church had to have this, that, and we went corporate. And, um, you know, how's that gone for us, by the way? Not, not gone that well, okay? So many of us are caught up in an entrepreneurial model, and we don't even know it. God is in the refining business, not the success business. God is in the refining business, not the success business. Success is predicated first on faithfulness and holiness. Being must precede doing. We need to focus on who we are, not what we're doing. Now, yes, we need to focus on what we're doing, okay? But we got to put one before the other. So I want to switch now and, and leave the, the burnout issue, and I want to talk about a topic that I've not really heard a whole lot of people talk about. And this, what I'm about to give to you, it was given to me, so it's not new to me. But it's this whole idea of building healthier churches emotionally, okay? So the greatest challenge of the 21st century is not just the growth of the church, but the health of the church. A dysfunctional church is not a modern phenomenon. For I am afraid that when I come, Paul says, I will not like what I find, and you will not like my response. I am afraid that I will find quarreling, jealousy, anger, selfishness, slander, gossip, arrogance, and disorderly behavior. If we want to become like the New Testament church, just go back to the church that you pastor. Okay? Stop and think about that. We romanticize the early church. 
But the early church was pretty messed up. Right? So we got to deal with that. So there's five types of dysfunctional churches, and this was taken from Manfred DeVries and Danny Miller, um, the neurotic organization. And I found this to be fascinating because it mirrors people. Okay? Because what's the church made up of? People. So there are paranoid churches. What does a paranoid church look like? Now, the reason why we're, we're looking at this is because you need to be able to, in some ways, identify the church that you're pastoring. Oh, that's what my church is going through. And if that's the church you're going through, then you need to tailor some things around the church where you're at. So what does a paranoid church look like? There's a general atmosphere of distrust, especially among leaders. There's a hypersensitivity. There's hidden motivations. There is a constant lookout for the enemy. The strength of a paranoid church is that they have a good knowledge of danger areas and can avoid risks. Paranoid churches talk a lot about the devil. A lot. I'm not saying it's bad to talk about the devil. I'm just saying the devil's behind every single thing. We need a $10,000 offering plate today. We got $8,500, that devil. I don't know. I don't know if there's the devil or not, you know? So, but a paranoid church is always looking for a scapegoat, and it's hypersensitive. A compulsive church, preoccupied with trivialities, a very highly rigid. Most fundamentalist churches, you know, the fundamentalist Baptist churches, most of them are compulsive churches. Highly rigid, having to make the right color, flowers, making it a spiritual issue, well-defined rules, lack of spontaneity, constant underlying anxiety, obstinate dogmatism. Now, there is a strength to the compulsive church. Highly focused, fine-tuned. It runs well. Dramatic churches. These are demonstrative churches. Hey, are you picking up denominations, by the way? Yeah, you should be picking up denominations because we have whole denominations that are based on some of these style churches. Demonstrative does everything big and with flair, need for attention from outsiders. Most mega churches are dramatic churches. Impresses with wow experiences. Depressive churches. Low self-esteem. Great deal of guilt. Mostly neurotic. Indecisive. Unsure. Unable to take risks. Outdated models of ministry. Overwhelmed with the reality of the world. And apathetic leadership. There's not much energy going on in a depressive church. The strength is it's difficult to make mistakes. Now, I'm not going to tell you the church that I pastored. I pastored four churches, but in one of those churches, Holly and I would go home on a Sunday night and say, you know, the good thing about the church is that I could do anything and they wouldn't care. <laughs> the bad thing about the church is that I could do anything and they wouldn't care. That was a depressive church. They didn't care. Yeah, whatever. Go ahead. Schizoid churches, marked coldness, indifference, non-involvement in the community. It feels safer um, Oh, in, the, in that they insulate themselves. When they're threatened, they become aggressive. They're inconsistent, vacillating. There's a tendency to be incestuous in the leadership, to be incestuous. My daddy was on the church board. I'm on the church board. I'm grooming my son or daughter to be on the church board. Um, meaning that they breed their own leaders. Visitors are seen as an intruder. I once got called on the carpet by a board member because our church was having too many visitors. And what is up with that? The strength is that they're indifferent to criticism. Okay? Um, what are the characteristics of a healthy church as opposed to the dysfunctional churches we just talked about? Um, Miller and DeVries gives these. Uh, a healthy church really has very few power struggles. 
is free of internal sabotages? Come on. Somebody say, what's an internal sabotage? Do you have an example on the tip of your tongue, or can you just say, yeah, this is what it is? What's an internal sabotage? You got plans to go do this? Oh, we're going to have the best VBS ever? And then there's one or two people that come along the side, and they start just meeting with a couple of the other people. You know, just nothing's formal. But you just, they're whittling it away. And before you know it, you come to the next board meeting. Well, I've been thinking, Pastor. Oh, boy. Here it comes. You know what I mean? Um, a healthy church avoids an atmosphere of secrecy. is relatively unfragmented. In other words, there's a high sense of unity. We're sort of, you know, we're never going to be 100%, but we're all sort of moving in the general direction, okay? Um, confronts conflict up front. Unhealthy churches do not confront conflict up front. They'll confront conflict like never, okay? Emotions are embraced and encouraged, <coughs> and people do not invade each other's boundaries. In other words, it's a high respect for the personhood culture. Does not tolerate troublemakers. Empowers the healthy but marginalizes the dysfunctional. So, I can't believe this, but in the last 12 years, we have formally kicked three people out of our church. I never thought I'd be in this place. But let me tell you about one of them. This particular person came to our church, and, you know, we kind of knew she was a little flaky. But, you know, I mean, sometimes there's a lot of flaky people that come to church. So how do you, how do you figure that out, right? I mean, I'm just being honest. I'm not being cynical. I'm just saying, hey, the church is for broken people. So, you know, you got people that are of all shapes and sizes that come. And so, you know, this person was just like a little flaky. And um, the longer they stayed, the flakier they got. And then they started going to particular Bible studies and saying all kinds of inappropriate things. And then she wrote a letter that she emailed to everybody she knew in the church that more or less accused me of following her around the church. And she had a sexual overtone to it. And she was just crazy woman. And I did a little bit digging, and she had been kicked out of three other churches. We were number four. And so we sat down, and then we had a series of meetings, and they, they didn't go well. None of them went well. But we finally sat down with the church board, and it was basically a 10-minute decision. Jonathan Russell... Our district lawyer said, I'll draft the letter. <laughs> End of discussion. It was out of my hands. Three board members met with this lady, said, if you ever step on the property again, we will call the police. Gave her the letter, read the letter to her. End of discussion. Now, that was an extreme example, right? I mean, I never thought I'd be in a position, but, you know, we're on three. Good grief. In healthy churches, they do not tolerate high dysfunction. They'll love you, but when you get out of line, it's almost like the system itself gives an abortion. You're done. In unhealthy churches, what ends up happening is the totally crazy dysfunctional person ends up getting a following because we need to love this person. I get it that we need to love this person, but if this person is dividing the church, do the most loving thing for the organism of the church and move them on because you are not going to heal them because their issues are greater than what the church can handle. Okay, now I know that that's controversial. Some of you may think otherwise. I'm just saying in this issue, the healthy church does not tolerate troublemakers. It will expel the troublemakers. If nothing else, just marginalize them and say, you can still come here, but we're not giving you any power. And it's almost never formal. It's almost quietly informal. Okay? Mark? Yes. So then in that situation, did you give the leadership an opportunity to grieve that loss? 
I don't think anybody was grieving, to be honest with you. But, but here's what was interesting. This blew my mind. The church board insisted on sending a congregational letter naming the person and saying why she was expelled. That blew my mind. It was bold, but I mean, we followed our lawyer, right? I mean, you know, we, he said, no, I don't have any problem with that. And he wasn't mean about it. He was like, in order to get the entire church on the same page, that everybody hears the same message, this person was so toxic. So, to get back to your question, I had to meet with two different ladies groups and just sit there and say, okay, talk to me. We did. Yeah. This was over like 10 months, 11 months. Yeah, it was a long road. It was a long period of time. Yes. And there are times when we have to tell people, you got to be gone. And I've had to do that too. But you know, don't celebrate. Okay? Just, sure. And, and not that you were doing that. Sure. I've heard that in the past happen. And it's always sad. Really. Just, well, it's an in spite of feeling. It's an in spite of feeling. Yeah. Okay? So we sat down with women's groups. We sat as a church board. We sat as a staff. And then we had some ladies saying, yeah, I, and I, get what you're go I get where we're coming from, but can we meet with her separately? And I said, sure, go ahead. <coughs> Just meet with her separately. It took three weeks. And these ladies came back and said, um, we can't do this. It's not good for us. You, you know what I'm saying? So in a, in a healthy church, you do have to draw lines and boundaries. You never celebrate them. At the same time, you, you celebrate the health that says we walk through the process correctly and we were able to save the unity of the church. Okay? Just a word to what you're saying. And that has to do with conflicting emotions. And we Americans have the idea you can't have conflicting emotions. And yet you do. You grieve on the one hand and rejoice on the other. And you're doing them both at the same time. Right. And you think you're, you almost think there's something wrong with me. But it's like a person who is, has like a, a horrible cancer death. And you've seen them suffer and suffer and suffer. And the moment of death, you're rejoicing. I am glad this is over. And yet you're still grieving death. Yeah, I agree. So yeah. It's, helping a, you know, it's, just it's the conflicting death. feelings. Absolutely. Sure. And whenever you tell a story, you're trying to keep the story short. But this is over 11 months, and there's lots of conversations. The big kicker was when we found out that she carried a gun in her purse every Sunday. That was a quick decision. <laughs> you know, that was an easy decision to make, you know, but it was still morning. Go ahead. Sure. But I think sometimes, not that I'm any expert on emotional health, but I think sometimes we make ourselves feel guilty about stuff that's not really. Right. So as ministers, we're supposed to be compassionate, right? And so there's the side of us that overcares, overloves, that says, I could have helped that person if just. And that you, you got to figure out that too. And everybody's at a different lot. Everybody's at a different place in the spectrum. Some people pretty easy. No, no, I can't do that. Other people are like, no, I have to grieve over that eight, nine, 10 months that I couldn't help this person. 
So yeah, I think there's a balance. Okay, we're coming up toward a break because the next topic is going to uh, be the minister's family and the whole social-based teaching aspect of it. Um, so developing a healthy church, um, teach people the principles of triangulation and how to de-triangle. Okay, so somebody give the explanation. We, we should know this, I think, but what's, what's um, triangulation? <laughs> Exactly. Say that a little bit louder. I tell you that you tell Holly because I don't want to tell Holly. Right. You're, you're not talking to the person. You're talking about the person to another person, hoping that the message gets back. Okay? So that really hurts the church. So the best that we can, if we're going to create healthy churches, we need to be able to teach triangulation, what it looks like, what it feels like, and then practice it yourself and, and model it. Okay? Uh, create a non-secretive atmosphere. Um, scripture, you know, walk in the light as he is in the light. Um, develop skills for managing change. Unmanaged change leads to chaos and dysfunctional systems. Um, uh, resist change. So there's a pace of change in the organization. There's how you communicate change in the organization. And if you're not careful about all that, there's a sense of chaos that takes place. And whenever there's chaos, everybody goes, oh! Ah! and they freeze up, right? Um, give leadership to the system, not the people. This is probably pretty controversial. Give leadership to the system, not people. The system is more important than the people. Okay, anybody want to challenge that? Could you uh, elaborate? <laughs> Great, you're going to make me explain it. Um, so people are very important, right? We, we live to minister to people. But if you don't take care of the system first, people are always going to be a problem. You have to take care of the system of how we deal with people. We, we give leader as leaders, we're called to be leaders of not just people, but of the systems of the people, how they function within that system. And if the system is broken or needs to be altered or changed, that's our job to fix or change the system. But if you're constantly focusing on the people, you'll never change the system, and the person will hijack the system. I mean, you, you see this all the time, right? You got a board decision. One of the board members comes to you afterwards. I had a board. I, okay, so this is in another church. I'm not going to tell you where. We'd have these board meetings, make decisions, and then the next day, I'd have a board member call me up telling me how the decisions that we made were wrong and how I should go against them and change them. And I'm like, but you were there in the board meeting. I know, I didn't want to cause any disunity. Really? I mean, what, what was up with that? So I was basically trying to do all of his dirty work because I really, this person was a very powerful person in the church. And then I realized I'm giving power to this person and not the system. And the system is derailing because this person is trying to do an end run. You know what I'm saying? Okay, I guarantee you there's got to be some pastor in this church that knows that they should be making some major changes in their church, but they're not doing it because they got two people. And there's two people in the church that are against this change, but everybody else knows it. And here's the crazy thing, and nobody wants to admit this, but the rest of the church is looking at you to see if you have what it takes to go against these two people. I'm just telling you, that's what's happening. They're not going to say it to you, but they're going to be watching. Is the pastor going to do the right thing? Or is the pastor going to appease these two people? Yeah. That doesn't usually happen because that's where leadership comes in. Right. Leadership is a Moses who doesn't like to do it and says to God, I can't talk, so I can't do this job. And God said, okay, I'll give you an errand, but you're still going to do the same job. You've got to, you're still the leader. Moses was still the leader, but 
God assisted him, but it's not the whole system that takes care of you. No. A system that's broken doesn't see its brokenness. It takes a leader. It takes to, a leader yeah. to see the brokenness. But okay. you see what I'm saying? I worry that I'm taking everything and just doing it when the system should be doing it. Yeah, so I don't know that you're a unique situation, okay? But let me just let me just say this. Sometimes we're so proficient at doing what we're doing, everybody stands around and goes, okay? And so people who are highly energized end up doing it all and have people on the side watching them, clapping, and they're like, no, you should join me. But people get intimidated about joining you because you're so proficient. They can never do it. I'm not saying that that's you. Okay. So this issue of giving leadership to the system, not the people, this is one of the reasons, there are many, but this is one of the reasons why churches are small. If you pastor the people but ignore the system, you put the lid on the organization. If you pastor the system and make sure that you take care of the people, that's okay. It really is. Mark, is the part about knowing that you're not the guy just to build that system? Sometimes. Like, I think in, so in my particular setting, right now where I'm at, I don't know that I'm the right system guy, so I'm going to sound the system out. Oh, no, no question. Out of his way to say, no, we're going to do this together, but I'm going to let you do what you do best. And right. And do what I do best. So I'm just kind of more of the working, working the... Uh, working the people side. Agree. So that goes back to what BW is saying, is that, you know, you, you got to find an Aaron, but you're still responsible. Ultimately, you're responsible for the system, though you may not be building the system. People will allow you to do what you do best, which that's a healthy system, right? But you still have to create the system. And if you're not the person to create the system, then you need to find somebody to help create the system. You still got to bless it. You still got to own it. You still got to cheerlead it on. But what I'm saying is, is that a lot of pastors spend so much time focusing on the people, they're not seeing the bigger picture of the system that would ultimately make the church and the people happier and better. That, that's what I'm saying. So this is great. Andy Stanley has this quote that I just picked up, and I said it yesterday in a sermon. Self-righteous people are rarely self-aware. It takes a humble person to say, Jay, it ain't me. Right? If you just admit it, and by the way, everybody knows it. Everybody in your church knows it. They know if you're a people person or a systems person. They know it. They're just waiting for you to admit it. Self-righteous people are rarely self-aware. If you're self-aware, you can do a lot. Okay, let's take a break. Let's come back at uh, about the 1025, 1030, and uh, we'll pick up on social-based teaching. Hey, go ahead. Hey, Johnny. Johnny, could you just get the the um, handouts from June so she doesn't have to go run up. Thanks. Okay, so when we're getting the handouts, sorry about that. Um, I didn't print enough. Pastor Byron came up to me during the break and he said, I want to take issue with, with that last comment just a little bit. So tell everybody what you said to me because I think that that's an extremely valid point. Okay, you hear this? Everybody? You want to come up here and say it? Test. Test. Okay. So, so I'm, I'm a systems guy, but when, when I saw that statement uh, about the system is more important than people, it, it made absolutely no sense. Uh, to me now, I don't know whether that's just you know the, the stylist, the style of the, of the wording, you know who, who wrote it, 
um, but but it just didn't it didn't connect with me. And and I, and I appreciate uh, I appreciated the 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 discussion about Moses and Aaron and, and all of that. But but the piece that made it make sense to me is the fact that that Jesus had a system, and it was to minister through 12 people. He cared about the crowds, but that's not where he spent most of his time. He spent most of his time with the 12 and the few others that were associated with that group of 12. And because of that, we're all here today. Um, and so uh, I, I, can, I can work through that issue of the system is more important than the people only in that, in that context. But if, to leave it as a flat statement that the system is more important than the people makes absolutely no sense to me. So. Um, I, I was able to make the connection. I don't know if anybody else struggled with it, uh, but I was sitting back there and I was going to say something, uh, you know, before the break. And then Mark, I, I sensed Mark wanted to move on, so I didn't say anything. That's why I whispered it to him privately. And he just asked me to come up and share my thoughts. So there you go. Cool. Everybody get that? Okay. Let's make a switch now. Um, want to talk about um, our families and our family systems. Um, so obviously, this is the most personal of what we're going to talk about today because what I'm asking you to do is, and by the way, you're not going to need to share this with anybody. So, you know, what I'm, I, what I'm saying to you, is your family prospering? Are you prospering physically? How's your wife or your husband doing? I'm not going to ask you to raise hand and go around, well, you know, how's your wife doing and how's your husband doing? So I want you to feel the freedom to just say, I'm just going to be honest with myself because you're not going to be called on to give any kind of comment about that, okay? So is your family prospering? If you have children, are they prospering? Um, if you're married, is your spouse prospering? And there's a lot of leadership development stuff that's based, called social-based leadership development. And so let's just walk through kind of like a 30,000-foot area and then drop down. Uh, what is social base? Social base refers to the personal living environment in which a leader operates and which provides... Emotional support, economic support, strategic support, and basic physical needs. So social base is really a fancy term for your home. And everything that your home provides for you and provides for the other members in your home. So we're not talking about the church now. We're talking about your own personal home. And that's why Holly's here. I want to make sure that, you know... Holly hears what's being taught, and, she, and we can get in the car and say, hey, bud, you're missing it at this mark. You know what I'm saying? So that's good. Um, but she's also here to share a little bit from a pastor's wife perspective. I know some of you ladies, you know, I mean, this isn't going to connect with you because you're the pastor. I understand. But from a pastor's wife perspective, some of the things that we've worked through and some of the things that she's dealt with, and I think it's better for her to say those things than for me to say those things that Holly would say those things. Does that make sense? So I'm trying not to triangulate, I'm trying to get her to, you know, just have her first voice, okay? So let's talk about emotional support in your home and in my home. Emotional support is when you provide your spouse and family companionship. Being a good listener. Affirmation of worth, empathy, understanding, recreational outlets, anything to do with the emotional makeup of you and your spouse, if you're married, and your children, if you have children, that's kind of where this is going. For the female... If emotional needs are not meant in the early years of ministry, for example, if your spouse, assuming your wife, if your wife is not connecting in the church or with you, particularly with you, 
and she doesn't feel this sense of connectedness within the church body that could spell disaster. Um, us guys, we're, we're pretty um, not self-aware on occasion, and so we're not often aware of the importance of our wives connecting to the church in a meaningful way. We're just not aware of it. We're like going great guns, everything's about the church, and we're, we're moving. Um, but... After we've experienced some bumps and bruises along the way, it's like the Lord knocks us upside the head, and we're like, oh, maybe it matters. So after some success or failure of our dreams, become, we become more aware. Later years develop marriage companionship. So here, here's a pattern that oftentimes happens. It doesn't have to happen, but here's what oftentimes happens. You take your first church, and you're gun-ho, and you're running like crazy. You leave your family in the dust, and you're always like, wow, well, what's up with them? Like, we're in this together, but they're not feeling like we're in it together. Um, back in the 80s, there was a common phrase, the, chur the church became my husband's mistress. Um, Bill Hybels is probably not a great example at this moment, but Bill Hybels wrote extensively on he's going to Wednesday, Wednesday or Thursday. I can't remember when they were. Maybe they were Friday night groups where he'd be talking to a thousand teens, and he and Lynn would get in arguments. And he said to her one time, you mean you want me to sit on the couch watching TV with you when there's a thousand teens over there that need the Lord? Well, that's helpful in your marriage, isn't it? But he was missing what she was saying. He wasn't hearing her. She was saying, I'm not feeling connected with you. Uh, for women ministers and their husbands, we get, we get a lot of help as men uh, in talking on this subject. Um, do you think the dynamic is different when uh, a woman pastor is uh, actually concentrating on these things as well and, and uh, having a, a husband who is the uh, supporting role to the ministers of needs emotionally and, and so forth and so on. Is, do you think there's a difference or uh, to you is it pretty much the same kind of thing? I don't have a great answer for that. Probably the ladies in the room who are pastors may have a better answer. Here's my speculation. And I say this with a little bit of fear and trepidation. I think in some ways it's all the same. I think it's very, it comes out in different ways. I just think it does. So anybody want to comment on that? Lady, anybody want to comment? Go ahead, Shirley. I think one of the main distinctions in the conversation is the cultural roles that are perceived by the man and woman in the home. I think the common tension No, I, I get it. That's good. That's good to bring that in. Thank you. So emotional support, economic support. What does economic support look like in the home? You know, it's a creating a financial base that covers expenses, you know, food, clothing, transportation, housing, you know, all of that. Uh, the challenges are cultural and generational expectations. A consistent struggle in this area yields deep anger and frustration. Interestingly, a younger generation, shared support for financial base is much more common than what it was 30 years ago, right? 30 years ago, you know, guys were supposed to, and I, and I know I'm sounding 
older when I say this, but you know, you, you understand. Guys were supposed to be the head of the home, which meant the economic support, and you know, the women could stay at home or at least work part time. A younger generation, m basically, both people are working full time now, most of the time, and so that creates differing expectations economically in the home. But at the end of the day, economically, when you talk about social base. You, you have to, either between you and your spouse or you, you have to be able to say, how are we prospering economically? Am I thinking about retirement? You, you may say that Jesus loves us and will take care of us. I get that. But what if you die and your spouse is left? Is there something for your spouse? Do you have a will? Do you have a dead letter? You know what a dead letter is? Anybody know what a dead letter is? So, back in 2011, I wrote Holly a dead letter. It is stuck in my financial papers. I told her where it's at. It's in a very marked blue bag. It's where I keep all of our bills. And in the letter, it starts off, Dear Holly, I love you so much, and I'm sad I'm not with you, but if you're reading this, I'm dead. Here's what you do. These are the first three phone calls you make. You call our lawyer, Jonathan. You call the Northwestern Mutual guy who used to be a pastor. His name is Jay Bergman. If you, you call the DS, right? You call these three people, and they will help you on the way. Do, do you got a dead letter? Because you could drop this afternoon. And what's your spouse going to do? Do they know? what to do. So that's economic. Um, economic needs involves the ability to minister freely without being hampered by anxiety about housing, medical needs, schooling costs, other life necessities. When the economic provider must get extra jobs or the spouse must join the work field, additional pressures arise which spill over. You get this? So they're not, they're not separate. They all spill over. Your economic issues will spill over into your emotional issues and into your strategic issues, which we'll talk about in a moment, and your physical needs. They all kind of blend together. They're all in the soup, right? We're only pulling them out for the sake of clarity, but they all go together. Strategic support. This um, means um, affirmation of life's goals, life goals, meaning your dreams, your hopes, Stimulation of thinking about life purpose and direction. Um, ability to set forth long-range perspective. Basically, in the home, you're asking you and your spouse, and sometimes the kids, depending upon you know, the ages, you know, well, where are we going? Um, do we need to adjust direction? This is the big picture issues. Have you talked to your spouse particularly if you're in your 50s or 60s, have you talked to your spouse about, so wh where do we really want to settle? I know it's 15 years, but where do you really want to settle? You want to settle in New Jersey? You want to settle in Pennsylvania? Oh, your folks live in Indiana. You, you, you want to move back to Indiana? Let's have that conversation. Don't wait until you're 67 or 70 or 72 to have that conversation. It's too late. Now you're under pressure. To make a decision. Now you got to buy a house or rent someplace. And if you buy a house and you realize three years later, I don't like living in a townhouse. I like cutting the grass. Have the conversations years in advance. Okay? Um, males, strategic things move to the forefront in the mid-40s and 50s. I don't know if it's a guy thing, but we don't really care about that stuff until we're in our 40s and 50s. We start asking questions, why am I doing this? You may realize that early dreams may not come true. The 40s and 50s are in natural evaluation time. I'm not saying it's not that way for women. I'm just saying that for men, it's a, it's a real time. The more you mature, you and your spouse, your life schedule, um, for both to finish well, each plays an important role in each other's development. Your goal ought to be not just to finish well, but to help your spouse to finish well because you go together. Basic physical needs. Physical needs include all the needs of a home base from which a person operates, including food, place to sleep, clothing, safety, security. Here's a question. Does your family feel safe where you're living? 
do they feel safe with you emotionally and physically? Those are important questions that you may not even think about asking, but we should. Um, is it a place of retreat and refreshment? One of the things that Holly has done extraordinarily well is to make our home a haven. And we're very conscious about having a lot of conversation about the church. We talk about the church all the time. But we also say, time out, we're not talking about the church today. Right? We're going to do some other things. We're going to talk, we're going to have fun. Is, the, is, is your home a haven? Okay? So where do you think you are at on these four areas if you are married? Again, I'm not asking you to respond, just um, ask some questions. Is your spouse prospering emotionally? Does your spouse feel connected and understood by me? Do my children feel emotionally connected and supported? Um, does everybody feel safe? Right? Economic. Are the necessities of life being taken care of? Food, clothing, shelter, transportation. Um, are, are my spouse and family, are we all on the same page with life goals? How do we make decisions? You know, as our kids got older, we brought them. We, we didn't do this when the kids were smaller. And I, I'm, I'm maybe 12, 13, 14 years old. We started the conversation. But as the kids got older, we talked about, so we feel like God may be calling us to this other church. Let's have the conversation. Don't, don't not bring your kids into the conversation when they're teenagers. Right? you got to have the conversations like that. Um, <clears throat> physical. Do my children and spouse have their basic physical needs met? So here's a chart, and um, it's, uh, it's, it's in your notes, so nobody's going to see it, but just mark where you think your spouse and family are at on these four levels. Emotional support. Just are, are, you, are you on the high end towards strength, or is that kind of a struggle area? You know if you're not on the same page. You just do. You know it. Just mark it. Economic support. You know, what are the challenges? Are, are you lower on that, or are you higher on that? Strategic support. Are you having the conversations about where we're going, where we're headed, where we're at? And the physical support. Yeah, so if you're living next to the church, right, I mean, it, you, you, you know, there's, there's always a feeling of I'm not really disconnected. Oh, I left my keys. I'll be right back. Oh, I left, the, oh, I left my Bible. Oh, okay, I'll be right back. Oh, sister so-and-so needs to get in the church. Oh, she stops by for the keys. And so, you know, if it becomes an issue, then, then you begin to address those things and say, hey, you know, and I, I don't know, maybe this is different than 30 years ago, but today I think most people are generally more respectful than what they were before. I, I don't know if that's true or not. It just feels that way. When we moved to Lansdale, we were in the parsonage for a year, right? And yeah, we had people stopping by, you know what I'm saying? But that was, that was not the norm. Most people were very respectful. Good to know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. The point of this exercise is, the, you know, first of all, do we recognize the importance of social-based needs? That's number one. Second, do we understand, do you understand your current social-based needs? And third, are you looking down the road now and becoming proactive to address the needs? Um, three core insights from social base. Over a lifetime, social base patterns will change. Just like there are seasons, empty nester season, you know, there are seasons of your life, the social needs change in different seasons of life. 
Some, marriage, uh, some are more important in different seasons of the marriage or home. For example, Holly and I are in a season that's emphasizing emotional strategic more than economic and physical. That's just where we're at. We're not really talking a whole lot about economic and physical things. We're talking more about the strategic issues. Um, we need to be proactive about these changes. If you're not, you're caught unaware. And if you're under pressure, you never make the, the best decisions while you're under pressure, particularly when it comes to the home. Um, we need to be aware that social-based needs um, that are unmet are seedbeds for dysfunctional patterns or a ministry crash. Very few ministers crash because their theology wasn't right or because they couldn't preach. Ministry crashes or dysfunctional patterns usually come out of these four bases. Affairs, pornography, um, economic issues. How many pastors have used the church credit card for purchasing personal things, saying that they were going to pay it back? Never, 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 never do that, ever. Did I say never? Right? You don't do that. And so it's the other things that knock you off the game, not your theology and not your preaching. And yet we focus more on our theology and preaching than almost anything else. I'm not saying you shouldn't focus on it. I'm just saying that it's these other things that derail you and derail me. So I'm going to ask Holly to come up. And um, there's a couple questions. I'll get my chair too. So just, you don't want to sit down? All right. Um, you want to be on this microphone? Okay, you can talk loud? Yeah. All right. So, you know, H Holly and I just wanted to be able to just, um, you know, more or less just say, hey, we're, we're a ministry couple, and, um, oh, okay. We're recording, so we need to have you at a microphone. Well, now I'm nervous. I wasn't nervous, but you're recording, and now I'm nervous. I know. And this will be on YouTube, posted everywhere. So you're fine. No pressure at all. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay, so um, tell us a little bit about your story, okay? Where, where, where were you raised? Where did you go to church? That kind of a thing. Well, this is my home church, and Mark and I were married here, and Pastor Chambers married us. So um, that's really, that's, and we met at ENC. And um, I fell hopelessly, sight on scene, in love with my husband the moment I saw him. I was at ENC, and I was in the dorm, and I was coming down the stairs, and I saw him, and I said, that is the man I'm going to marry. And she I had had cataract surgery and had these things on her eyes, so it was totally sight on scene. Yeah. And I never regretted it. And I seriously love him more today than yesterday, but not half as much as tomorrow. And he is my best friend and my most favorite human, and I respect him. And I'm grateful beyond measure to be on this journey called life in the ministry together. Because in my opinion, he's magnanimous, and he's made me a better person. Whoa, we're, we're really getting deep here. Um, um. When we were at ENC, our first date, we were going to the Mug and Muffin, which is sadly no longer there. And we were walking um, on Elm Street. And I didn't even know, like, what he was going to be doing in his life, so I thought this was a great time to have that conversation. And he said he's going to be a pastor. Nope, nope, nopity nope. I'm not doing that. But, um, and I started to unpack that with him, and he started telling me about his vision about going into the ministry. And I started giving a little resistance. And then he said, woman, I'm going on an adventure. I want you to come with me, but I'm going on with or without you. You said that. You should have said that publicly. I can't believe you said that publicly. <laughs> and I'm like, Shazam, this is the man for me. Um, I don't know what ministry is. I wasn't raised up close and personal in a ministry family um, necessarily. My perceptions when um, I was dating Tom Chambers for a while, 
So when I was over the Chambers house, um, I saw what I thought to be my perception of ministry. So I thought, well, it's not my first choice for a life path, but it's not that bad. Um, Howard and Karen and Steve and Tom and this church, it's going to be great. So um, I started interviewing other pastor's wife, families that looked like um, they were healthy. And I got together with Edie Metcalf, um, the pastor's wife from Wally Church. And then later on, Connie Huffman, um, our pastor's wife from our church in Kansas City that we were attending. And then um, Karen Chambers. I brought my notebook. I got all ready. I leaned in. And when Karen and I, in particular, uh, went out together, um, she said something that I was unprepared for her to say. She said, and I'm ready. I'm getting my bullet points. I have my pen. To thy own self be true. I was 21 years old. I didn't know who I was. What's thy own self be true mean anyway? It takes a lifetime to unpack that. So I thought based on what I knew of myself at the time, OK, I can do this. Um, life happens, takes us off guard. Um, we had to choose to press in to the Lord first and second to each other. Ministry is hard. It's not for the faint at heart, isn't it? And I had unrealistic expectations. I was an idealist and a Pollyanna. So I thought that if I just followed this recipe, things would eventually evolve with health. And people would be coming to my house with baked homemade pies, the way they did with Karen and Howard Chambers. Folks, I don't know about you, but I'm still waiting for that baked homemade pie. Um, so we had some things happen to us in Kansas City, and then we moved here. And our first church was Mukunji. And um, you know, we pressed in, and there were certain tools there for a little bit that was helpful. There was Wilcon um, that was helpful. That's a um, retreat for a week up at ENC for all for pastors' wives, and started networking. There was a magazine that the Pub House had put out for pastors' wives, and that was helpful. Um, but basically, in the 80s, things started changing. There was a shift in ministry. There was a shift in how people worked as a couple together. Um, we were coming out of basically a little bit of a legalistic fishbowl to what I think now is a little bit more healthy. But I was in that uh, gritzy time where things weren't kind of just settled into this new season of what I feel like the girls are experiencing today, which is a little bit more balanced. So in my own um, in my own journey, it was very hard, and it was very lonely. And Mark and I had a lot of conversations about trying to make our home a haven and what that looked like. And um, so therefore, when we went to a retreat, it was at Sandy Cove and Pastors and Wives Retreat, we had the Hamiltons. I don't remember. He was a professor at seminary, but I don't remember of what. But um, his wife was there. And she pulled us aside, all the women, and the guy got the guys together. And she talked about um, friendships in the church for women and that there aren't any for us wives to network. There aren't safe people. And um, I said that I'm going to be who I am based on the quote, to thy own self be true. And I had some kickback, some resistance with that. And um, women started crying and sharing that, that they lead a life of quiet desperation. And it was that then that I said, another woman said that um, my husband is not having an affair, but the church is his affair. The church is his mistress. And then she came to me crying and saying, and I can't compete with that. And it got me very concerned about the trajectory of my marriage and my home and our health. And I've been very, very grateful that Mark has had a humble posture, that he was not defensive, that he was willing to be made willing in entertaining these concepts as we were wrestling with them, pretty much alone. Thank you, Jesus, for sending different people in our life to help us and giving us the Holy Spirit. But nevertheless, there was not a safety net for us in those formulative years. 
So um, I use certain tools to help me in this pathway. And um, one of the tools that helped me was um, my beloved 3x5 cards. You guys, I love neon colors in these 3x5 cards. This is just a smidgen of what I have. Some boys collect, maybe grown men, baseball cards. I collect words. I collect phrases. I collect poems. I collect Bible verses. I collect these things, and I use them as tools to fill up my heart, to give me perspective, to give me fresh insight. Because you guys, I've seen a lot of bitter pastor's wives. I've seen a lot of unhealthy, imbalanced parsonage families. I've seen women who have chosen to be cynical. And one of the things that Mark and I do that I appreciate in our marriage that we have always recalibrated. And when we're in a difficult time period in our marriage, maybe it's outside forces going like this and just breaking us down. Maybe it's inside conflict. Maybe it's just simple as guy-girl things. But when those times happen and we hit a wall, we always recalibrate and say, the bottom line is this. I'm in love with you, and you're in love with me. We go back to what we knew, but maybe in a nanosecond forgot because of pressures. And it occurred to me, why don't we do that with the Lord? Or why don't I do that with the Lord? Why don't I do that with church? Some of us come from dysfunctional families. My family of origin is really sadly dysfunctional. So I started um, recalibrating like that. The bottom line is that I know who I am because I know who I am in Christ. In our churches, when they have hurt us, when women triangulate and want to be my friend to get to Mark, when women want to be my friend because they want to know something, because they want to know the nitty-gritty inside workings of the church. When I want to be their friend, thinking I could share my heart with you because my personality is that I'm an outside processor. I'll keep you, your stories tucked in my vault, but I want to outside process with a safe person. And I'm fairly good judge of safe people but I'm imperfect, and I don't get it right all the time. And I've been like shards of glass attacking my heart. I've been so crushed with some of the unkind things that people have done or said. But just like we do with our families of origin, at some point we say, you know what? I'm not going to be that DNA. I'm going to recalibrate because of what God has done in my life. And I'm going to use the scripture, and I'm going to use quotes, I'm going to find meaning in everything because God is in charge of everything. And so, therefore, what I would say to pastor's wives is allow there to be safe conversation so that your wife can process out loud with you without judgment. As husbands who are pastors, don't preach to your wife. Listen to your wife. Be better than Planet Fitness. There's no judgment zone because she might not have a safe place to be. And if your wife is cynical or bitter, guys, you take your car to a tune-up, get your wife some help. Help her. Come alongside of her. Listen to her, whether it's help in a counseling situation, formal, or help her find a friend and a safe place to land. Um, books have been an invaluable resource. The first book I had... Um, that I read, and I'm not necessarily a reader, I'm more of an audio type person, but the first book I read, it was because I was put on bed rest with our, uh, um, we had three, I've had three pregnancies, but my second child, um, I was put on bed rest because I almost died uh, with our second child. Um, but anyway, so it gave me a lot of time, and I read an invaluable book that has changed my life. And it's High Call, High Privilege by Gail McDonald, M.C. Donald. 
And um, she talks about um, being centered. She talks about realistic expectations. She talks about conflict management. And when Mark was in seminary, I did the ladies' inspirational fellowship time, <laughs> and it was lift. And so, you know, we weren't formally going to school. But if you have an unhealthy wife, she can't be an invaluable asset to her husband. Um, she's probably of grave concern to her husband. And maybe then he can't function at optimal, optimal power. And I thought to myself, I want to finish well. I want to be as healthy as I can be. I've gotten it wrong a lot. But I want to focus on those people who can help me get it right. And um, she introduced me to Henry Nowen and Viktor Frankl. And she, helped, she introduced me to great thinking people who got me out of my, my little world, my little way of thinking. She helped me to see when you're going through struggles, you focus up and you focus out. Untended fires soon die and become a pile of ashes. Who is sparking our ashes into flames for Jesus? That's an inside job. Nothing in life can hurt me, whether I win or lose. Though life may be changed on the surface, I do my main living within. So therefore, the joy that I have or don't have, when people in the church let me down, misinterpret who they think I am, it's OK, because I know who I am on the inside. And then with my story, I can reach out. And your pain doesn't necessarily go away. It just becomes common. But if you only focus on your pain, and if you think you're the only one, and you're not reaching out to extend that bridge of health and love and infuse hope into hurting hearts, you think you're the only one. And hope deferred makes a heart what? Depressed. And we don't have to be there. We don't have to stay there. So therefore, the way I differentiate myself from my family of origin because they're dysfunctional, I can recalibrate. When Mark and I are hitting and missing, we can remind ourselves what the bottom line is. And to avoid being a cynic, to avoid being a bitter pastor's wife, we can employ those same techniques into the church. Because a church is just full of sheep. We're easily led. It's a hospital where there's hurting people. And we could put things in context as we put who we are in his context. Some of the quotes that I just love on my three by five cards. And I have these in my medicine cabinet well, actually, I don't have a medicine cabinet anymore, but I have these in my drawers. I had them taped in my medicine cabinet. Remember the metal ones that you open up with the mirror and there's those little shelves? And, and if you were in parsonages like I was, um, they're oftentimes they're, they're rusty, you know, and the door squeaks when you open them up. So I had all these in my medicine cabinets because, you guys, I forget what I know. And I need a fresh infusion of the Holy Spirit to revive my heart when it's tired and when it's weary. And I have these in my drawers. I have these in my purses. I have these in my books as book um, markers. And I share them, too, like baseball cards when I have to. So through the years, my, my um, pile has been depleted. As when I've talked to somebody and I've listened to what they're not saying, I can, oh, I have this for you. Because maybe that could be a little block, a little chain link in their growth process to help them the way some of these quotes have helped me. Um, so God has a purpose for your pain, a reason for your struggle, and a gift for your faithfulness. Don't give up. I, I just love cast all your cares on him till the storms of life are over and the trusting days are past. God is our refuge and our strength and ever-present help in our times in tr of trouble. Um, I don't know. These are just things that matter to me. Um, these are just chronicling my journey. Um, 
these are things that have helped me in my struggle and my pain to regain equilibrium and perspective. I think women forget. I think women struggle with perspective more. We forget what we remember. And I'm glad that I have my husband that he could say, no, 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 it's not like that. Guys, if you're afraid of your wives because they're a force to be dealt with, you're hurting yourself, you're hurting your family, you're hurting your church. Finish well, speak up. You're not going to be conflicted on the inside because you're going to do the right thing by speaking okay. truth. No, I, I just no that's know. it. No, I'm just asking, um, is there a moment where we can have some Q&A in terms that of was it? Because I don't want to read all my cards yeah. because no, that's okay. I don't want to take that time. One, one of the things that I asked Holly to do was do exactly what she just did, and I wasn't we, we didn't tie it with a bow to figure out what, what her last thing was, so I apologize for interrupting No, no, you. that was it. But I think that for guys, and, and I'm not trying to eliminate the ladies in the room, but I think that for guys, this is an opportunity to ask a pastor's wife any kind of question you want to ask her. Because it's always us in the room. It's not your spouse. Right? So... One of the things that we wanted to do is to just simply provide an atmosphere where you could ask a question about maybe the way Holly would see it or just about how can I be a better husband to my spouse, you know. Um, so do you have any questions that you would like to have Holly field? Or make comments? Sure, thank you. The question was about relationships. How hard or difficult was it to forge some? Um, it was difficult. Um, Mark, his calling was to churches that were broken for the most part. And so, um, so um, we, I've had to look outside. And I've had to ask the Lord, um, to have a friend, you have to be a friend. So am I having difficulties in finding friendships because I need to reignite what it is to be a friend? And then I need to figure out what that is and then be that friend to other people. And then when I was better at relationships, friendships came better because I could detect healthier people because I want to be um, kindled with people who are healthy. Iron sharpens iron. So it's hard because of trust issues and because of confidentiality issues. So, does that answer your question? Okay. Holly, if you um, were thinking recreationally or otherwise, do you think of like seeking work home with her? How do you not put your head? How does my husband or how do I? How do I? Um, this is so cool. So, I was running women's ministries um, in a church, and we were having a special speaker come, and there was a lot of components to that, and so there was this woman coming in, which typically uh, once a month, we didn't always have outside speakers. Um, there was uh, a special food. There was a craft. There was all these different components to this women's get-together that I was running at our church, and I had a committee of women. Um, after the ladies met at the church to set up, the council, I ran home, got the dinner for the kids, got the kitchen cleaned up, gave Mark the instructions about putting the girls to bed, got myself together, running back over to the church, getting ready to set this up. This woman calls me over and she goes, I need to talk to you about something. I'm like, oh, okay. So I came over and she said, you forgot to take off your hat. I don't look good in hats. I'm not a hat person. So I didn't know what she meant. And then in a nanosecond, I deduced that she meant my emotional hat. When I left the home and I came to the church, I was barking out orders. And I was telling the ladies what to do. <sighs> that's not who I am, but that's what I did. But I didn't remember that. So 
I feel like to taking off a hat, the drive that I take to church is often more quiet. It, it very seldom has music, even praise music. I want to hear what the Holy Spirit has to say to me as I'm getting ready to re-engage either going to church or coming home from church to take my hat off or put it back on. Hat on, hat off. You know? Go ahead, Jim. Yes, so the question was, how do we handle our kids? How have we handled our kids emotionally when the husband, the pastor father, is away from the house with meetings and all that kind of stuff all the time? Um, one of the things, and again, I preface this with, with saying we didn't get it well all the time. I mean, we weren't perfect. We were aspiring to attain, but we hadn't completed perfection. So... Connie Huffman, the pastor's wife out into the church when we were in Kansas City, when we went out, she said she treats her children the way she would treat her children as a Christian in a church, not as if we were in a fishbowl, not as if they were unique and not in ministry. I mean, she just treats them regular. So therefore, there was a time when we were in our first church and on a Wednesday night when there was prayer meeting, Mark and I chose to go to the school and they were having square dancing for our daughter. And that we was had before the manual statement came out. <laughs> so full disclosure, I went to a dance before the statement came out. Yeah, because we <laughs> wanted to show our kids were a priority. However, there are seasons in the life of the church when it's nuts. You have... You have the trifecta of three things happening all at once, and it hits the fan, and you're running on empty. You have the holidays, and those wonderful Christmases when Christmas is on a Sunday. They're exhausting. So I try to have my girls understand that um, we're in a crazy season right now. And what Mark would do is to balance it out with other times. He was always home at dinner. He was not... If he had a cell phone back then, he would not have been the kind of dad that had it with him all of the time checking. He would have put that away in another room during dinner time. He was there with them emotionally, physically. And the other thing is, spontaneously, we would take the girls out of school, either pick them up or have them not go. And we would do something crazy fun. And it doesn't mean crazy fun and expensive. It means crazy fun and together. And so the busy times were a balance. And I reframed it for the girls. And I think this is really important. You guys, you get to share your dad. You get to share your dad. So they didn't hear it from me. Yeah, dad's gone again. Yeah. With a dismissive, cavalier, disrespectful attitude. I didn't want them to feel that at all. And I feel like Mark did a really good job being a balanced person in that regard. So let me make a comment on that. It's really our job as the pastors to make sure that our kids are feeling emotionally connected. So that means you always take a day off. You always take a vacation. Um, you know, for us, I never took dinner meetings. If I had to go out for a meeting, it was always have a meeting at 7 o'clock. It was not have a meeting over dinner. I always wanted to be home during dinner. The other thing is we, I always tried to be out no more than two or three nights a week. No more. There were seasons, of course, when I was out four or five nights a week, but they were the exception. The rule was two or three. And the other thing is, Jungmo, your kids are going to say that no matter what. And so you just roll with it, and you listen to the Holy Spirit, and sometimes you go, you know what, we're taking a day where we're all going to some place, and we're taking you out of school. You know, it's not, you know, your kids will survive being out of school one day, right? And so we, tr we just tried to do a lot of that to make up for the crazy times. So go ahead. <laughs> 